thank you. Uh, so I would first of all like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians as well as Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology for giving me this opportunity. Today, the topic will be on management of hepatocellular carcinoma in 2022. So the overview of my talk is on first on epidemiology, then pathogenesis of HCC, diagnosis, staging, management, and surveillance and prevention of hepatocellular carcinoma. So with regards to epidemiology, uh, liver cancer is the sixth leading cause of cancer worldwide, and it is the third most important cause of cancer-related death worldwide. So this just gives a perspective on why uh, hepatocellular uh, liver cancer is so important. Then HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, accounts for more than 90% of primary liver cancers. And underlying liver disease is the most important risk factor. Hepatitis B virus as well as hepatitis C virus is the most important risk factor worldwide, followed by NAFLD, which is probably more important in our setting, and alcohol-related liver disease as well as aflatoxin. Then uh, briefly touching up on the pathogenesis of hepatocellular carcinoma. So, uh, in cirrhosis or uh, chronic liver disease, it's a field uh, change which leads to the uh, development of hepatocellular carcinoma. And as you can see, chronic hepatitis, advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and from then on, the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma increases. So uh, this is important in prevention, primary or secondary or tertiary. And uh, the potential uh, strategies to prevent HCC, I will touch on later. But uh, I have to note here that 25% of cases occur in the absence of chronic liver disease. So diagnosis of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, in the background of cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma can be safely confirmed non-invasively by imaging. However, in the absence of cirrhosis, the diagnosis should be confirmed with histology. Non-invasive image assessment is only useful if the lesion size is more than one centimeter and uh, multiphasic CT or dynamic contrast MRI is the preferred imaging modalities and these are preferred over contrast enhanced ultrasound. Uh, then uh, PET, uh, PET uh, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. It's a PG PET not recommended in the early diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma because of a high false negative rate. Then uh, with regards to diagnosis, like I've said earlier, if the lesion is more than one centimeter as detected on uh, ultrasound surveillance or uh, ultrasound done for uh, symptoms, uh, then for confirmation of uh, the diagnosis, uh, multiphasic contrast enhanced CT or MRI can be done. And if the, either of these, not both of these, and if there are positive findings on the imaging, if that's confirmatory of HCC, then you can proceed with management of the lesion. However, if it is not confirmatory, depending on what for which imaging modality was used earlier, then the second imaging modality can be used to see if the confirmatory findings are present. And if it's diagnostic, then of course it's HCC. However, if the confirmatory imaging findings are absent, then there's a place to proceed with biopsy. Then about uh, lesions which are less than one centimeter in size, a repeat ultrasound should be done at four months. And if the lesion is stable in size, it can be repeated in another four months. Uh, so if it's a cirrhotic patient who undergoes uh, surveillance ultrasound, uh, after one year of uh, repeated ultrasounds and the lesion is stable, then you can go on to routine surveillance, which is six monthly. However, if the lesion changes in pattern or if the lesion is growing, then you go on to either CT or MRI. Then uh, about LRADs, a uh, lot of you might have seen this being reported on the uh, CT or the ultrasound, uh, CT or the MRI. So uh, LRAD 5 is the one which is confirmatory of uh, CT. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail on this, but this is uh, the uh, probability, the 
diagnostic probability of uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma according to imaging. Then treat, what are the treatment options available for hepatocellular carcinoma? First off, this is the most curative option available, liver transplant, which can be through a live donor or a cadaveric donor. Then hepatectomy, resection of the lesion. It can, it can be either anatomical or non-anatomical. Then ablation, taste, transarterial chemoembolization, which are more palliative than curative. Then tear, transarterial radioembolization, and systemic therapy, again palliative, multikinase inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Then hepatectomy. So this is the decision to go ahead with hepatectomy will be decided by the presence of the liver, liver function, the uh, function of the liver, of the residual remnant liver, as well as the presence of portal hypertension. Then uh, percutaneous ablation, there are mainly two uh, methods available, radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, and ethanol ablation is also available. However, radiofrequency ablation and microwave ablations are the preferred modalities with uh, probably uh, better performance of microwave ablation over radiofrequency ablation. Then staging of hepatocellular carcinoma. This, this is important for treatment allocation. Prognostic assessment is complicated by the underlying liver disease, unlike most other solid, solid malignancies. TNM classification has uh, minimal value in hepatocellular carcinoma. Then uh, we have the alternative VCLC. There are a lot of uh, staging systems, but VCLC, Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer System, is the most widely used and the validated. It is based upon the tumor burden, liver function, which is assessed through child score or MEL, but these are not ideal. Albi, albumin bilirubin scoring has a place. This is used mainly to classify child A into further prognostic groups. And then uh, performance status. ECOG scale uh, is used here. Uh, I must also mention the performance status mentioned here, the ECOG scale is the performance status due to the malignancy, not the pre-morbid uh, performance status. Then uh, this is the ECOG scale. It is from one to six. Then uh, treatment de decisions and uh, MDD-based, multidisciplinary team-based approach is essential, which is guided by the BCLC system. However, it's important that it's an individualized decision depending on the age, the comorbidities, as well as the choice of the patient. And uh, team board should include a hepatologist, oncologist, GIO, HPV surgeon, and an interventional radiologist. So this is uh, in one diagram what the BCLC approach is. So I will go into detail on uh, what uh, each of these is, but uh, I want to show here that uh, from early, very early stage, BCLC zero to advanced stage, BCLC C, that uh, all of these have preserved liver function. That's a requirement for treatment. And uh, the other thing is with terminal stage, with the uh, advanced liver disease, the prognosis is very poor. So BCLC zero, not very early stage, uh, is a solitary tumor less than two centimeters with preserved liver functions, no vascular invasion, no extra hepatic spread, no tumor related symptoms. So performance status zero. Then uh, if the patient is for liver transplant, hepatectomy is the ideal solution. This is because uh, then if the patient is not for liver transplant, then the, uh, the option is ablation. So the recent uh, ablation is a cheaper alternative as well as relatively non-invasive, but the reason to recommend hepatectomy is because of the availability of histopathology. And if there's microvascular invasion in the hepatectomy uh, histology specimen, that will lead you towards liver transplantation. So that's why it's the preferred option for patients who have the option of liver transplant.
So both are if uh, radio frequency ablation or microwave ablation is the preferred ethanol ablation only if technically uh, not possible to go ahead with the radio frequency ablation or microwave ablation. Then uh, BCLC A early stage. Uh, what's changed here from BCLC uh, zero is solitary hepatocellular carcinoma, irrespective of size. Earlier it was only lesions less than two centimeters in size and multifocal hepatocellular carcinoma up to three nodules, none more than three centimeters. So I will later go on to explain why they've used this criteria. This is the Milan criteria. Uh, then again, no macrovascular invasion, no extra hepatic spread no cancer-related symptoms and preserved liver functions. Then uh, out in this category, solitary hepatocellular carcinoma. So I've actually uh, simplified uh, the management of solitary hepatocellular carcinoma. This is probably an oversimplification, but this is much easier to understand. Uh, if a solitary hepatocellular carcinoma, you check uh, for clinical significant portal hypertension or raised bilirubin. And in the absence of these, Hepatectomy is the ideal solution. And if uh, clinical significant portal hypertension or raised bilirubin is present, then liver transplant is an option. Then liver transplant is the uh, ideal solution. But if not for liver transplant, ablation would be the uh, next step. And if ablation is also not possible, there's something called tumor stage migration. So even if the patient is in BCLC-A, then uh, the patient needs to be migrated to the next stage and case or care should be considered. Then uh, resection in the absence of clinical significant portal hypertension, like I've said, and uh, liver transplant is the preferred option in the presence of clinical significant portal hypertension. However, there is a place for laparoscopic resection in the background of minor clinical significant portal hypertension uh, if liver transplant is not a feasible option. Ablation is uh, limited by uh, the size of the hepatocellular carcinoma. Most of the time, if the lesion is more than two centimeters, this is less effective. However, uh, TEA or TES can be considered for solitary nodules and TEA only if the lesion size is less than 8 centimeters. And uh, these treatment options can be considered while awaiting liver transplant if the waiting time exceeds 6 months. Then about multifocal HCC still within BCLC-A. With, if they are within Milan criteria, so that's the reason why they included uh, the lesion size as well as the lesion number. So Milan criteria is the recommended criteria that should be present to decide on liver transplant or to go ahead with liver transplant. A single lesion less than five centimeters or less than three nodules, each less than three centimeters. Ablation and resection, there's a high risk of recurrence. So multifocal lesion, if they are within Milan criteria, liver transplant is the best option. Then uh, BCLCB, intermediate stage, uh, what's changed from the other criteria is the presence of multifocal hepatocellular carcinoma, but outside Milan criteria. And again, no vascular invasion, no extra hepatic spread, preserved liver functions, no cancer-related symptoms. This is a very heterogeneous group. Prognosis is influenced by alpha beta protein levels as well, and uh, increased bilirubin more than two milligrams per deciliter or fluid retention needing diuretics. This patient needs to be uh, stage migrated into uh, BCLCC. So, if the lesions are well defined in BCLCB, they can be still for liver transplant. In some centers, they have extended liver transplant criteria. However, this is uh, probably not recommended in our setting. Uh, alpha beta protein more than 1000 nanograms per deciliter is an exclusion criteria for liver transplant in most centers. Then uh, what about the patients who are not for liver transplant but have well-defined nodules? Taste for well-defined nodules has a place in this. 
conventional tests using chemotherapy. Doxtropocene is what we use here, emulsified in lipid oil, followed by gel form. Then uh, diffuse HCC with no well defined uh, nodules, extensive liver involvement, increased bilirubin or fluid retention need in diuretics, no benefit from taste. They, they needed to be uh, considered for tumor stage migration, like I mentioned earlier. So they might benefit from systemic therapy. Then PCLCC, this is advanced stage, and uh, irrespective of the tumor burden, Vascular in, in the presence of vascular invasion or extrahepatic spread, preserve liver function again. So, like I mentioned earlier, from BCLC naught to BCLCC, it's preserved liver functions. They might have tumor related symptoms as well. So, this includes any patient in the previous stages who will not benefit or who. Uh, who, in whom the treatment recommendations are not feasible. So systemic therapy, uh, there was a 2022 new update from the BCLC, which was, uh, there was a review article in Journal of Hepatology, and now the first line systemic therapy, the preferred option is atazolizumab plus bevacizumab. So we have bevacizumab, it's a monoclonal antibody, uh, anti-angiogenic factor, but atezolizumab is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. You might have heard of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, these are recently uh, used in a lot of uh, cancers, which were untreatable by most other therapies, including non-small cell lung cancers and uh, squamous cell malignant uh, skin malignancies. Uh, however, they are very, very expensive and uh, most of them are not available in Sri Lanka and they have only a survival advantage of about uh, two to three months compared to sorafenib. Then uh, sorafenib is what we have been using up to now as first line, as systemic therapy, but the problem with sorafenib is most of our patients are intolerant to the effective dose. So there are a lot of side effects from sorafenib and uh, even the survival advantage with sorafenib, which is again an expensive drug, is uh, low. So BCLC and D end stage. So this is irrespective of hepatocellular carcinoma burden. If the patient has impaired liver functions and when liver transplant is not an option, and they might have major cancer-related symptoms. So this includes a broad group of patients in whom the liver functions are impaired, but their hepatocellular carcinoma might be at any stage from a less than two centimeter one to a, a multinodular hepatoma. The treatment for HCC in this group will not change the expected survival due to the underlying liver disease. Palliative care with symptomatic management is the ideal solution in them. So uh, the other thing I need to mention here is if uh, the patient has, let's say, a de decompensated cirrhotic patient or a child C patient uh, undergoes ultrasound and there is no liver transplant plans and you detect a hepatoma, there is no point in going ahead and doing CT or MRI uh, to confirm the presence of a hepatoma because this is not going to change the management. Then uh, the supportive scare, paracetamol less than one gram per day for mild pain. NSAIDs should be avoided, especially in the background of cirrhosis. Opioids can be used, but constipation should proactively be managed. And uh, in patients with advanced cirrhosis, we have to be careful with psychoactive drugs, and especially benzodiazepines. And uh, bone meds, there might be a place for palliative radiotherapy. Then uh, adequate nutrition should be uh, addressed. So assessment of response should be done with imaging, CT or MRI. Then uh, there are other uh, M-resist and resist 1.1 uh, calculators we use to assess the response. Then uh, progression after treatment. Uh, growth more than, so the, it might be the patient might have been in BCLCB or BCLCC. So uh, the progression might be the presence of a new lesion or the increase in size of an existing lesion. 
so there are progression uh, which is untreatable or progression with stage migration. When what about surveillance? So all cirrhotic patients, child A and B should have surveillance. Any child C patient awaiting liver transplant should also have surveillance. non cirrhotic hepatitis B virus patients at intermediate to high risk of hepatocellular carcinoma should have surveillance. However, like I mentioned earlier, child C patients not for liver transplant, there is no place for surveillance. So by surveillance, uh, I mean ultrasound done by an experienced radiologist every six months, combined with serum alpha beta protein levels every six months. So there's some controversy on the use of alpha beta protein levels. However, the latest uh, ESO guidelines recommend the use of alpha beta protein levels. So prevention is mainly management of the underlying chronic liver disease then prevention of viral hepatitis, especially through hepatitis B virus universal vaccination, then health policies, implementing measures to lifestyle, implement measures to uh, induce healthy lifestyle, to reduce the risk of obesity and alcohol dependence, and measures to prevent transmission of viral hepatitis. Then with regards to prevention of progression of the chronic disease, of, disease, of course, treatment of the underlying disease, and there has been a lot of data showing coffee consumption to reduce the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in chronic liver disease. So this should be actively encouraged in patients with uh, chronic liver disease. Then take home messages. Hepatocellular carcinoma is an important cause of cancer as well as cancer mortality worldwide occurs commonly in the background of chronic liver disease. A good surveillance program is mandatory for early detection in the at-risk population. A multidisciplinary approach, approach is essential for individualized decision making. So like I mentioned earlier in my talk, uh, BCLC is just the guidance, each, uh, each uh, management strategy for each hepatocellular carcinoma should be discussed at an MDD and it should be an individualized approach. Appropriate therapy should be offered to the appropriate patient according to best available resources. Thank you. So again, I would like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians and Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had a, a connection issue. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, there is one question if you could kindly take. Uh, it's yes. what are the recommended drugs and targets of in patients with SITs due to clinically significant portal hypertension, pyrolactone alone or combination with loop diuretics. If you could kindly spend a minute answering that, I'll be most grateful. Thank you. Uh, yes, sure. So that was done uh, my topic. Um, drugs and targets of management. So, uh, so spirolactone is uh, recommended as first-line therapy in a patient who is uh, having the first episode of ascites, but in the presence of recurrent ascites, it is recommended to combine it with the uh, which will actually reduce the risk of compl complications. And the goal of use of diuretics is in a patient who has edema, the weight loss should not exceed one kilogram of weight loss, otherwise uh, daily, otherwise 6.5 kilograms daily. And the goal of diuretics is to use the uh, uh, minimum possible dose for the minimum possible time and uh, if you once you start diuretics you reassess the patient and if the patient's uh, ascites or the edema is reducing your goal is to reduce the dose of diuretics and maintain the patient on the minimum possible dose of diuretics to maintain the patient in a volumic state did i answer the question or should I elaborate uh, more? Thank you very much. I mean, thank you for using your expertise to answer a question outside of your lecture also. <laughs> but since anyway, you're dealing with a medical be a complication of that as well, because, uh, you know, arising in a background. So I'm, I'm grateful that you answered. Thank you very much, Achini. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll try to flash up the date of appreciation. 
but you will certainly get it in electronic or printed form in the near future. This is your certificate. Thank you very much. I'm most grateful as the president of the CCP for, for you to spend your time and join this forum. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining. And then uh, let's meet next month with a specialty update, but we'll have other programs from the CCP during the coming few weeks as well. Have a pleasant afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much.